Welcome to our studies in the book of Daniel. We are actually on chapter six. We've dealt with the historical portion of the book, and now we're moving into some of the deep prophecies. I'm so glad you've joined us. We're thrilled when I look at the numbers of people watching, and we have hundreds, thousands of people studying the book of Daniel with us. In addition to that, there are families that join. Some invite their children. So if you have children, get their Bibles out and notebooks and pads and encourage them to study the book of Daniel with us. There are small groups that use this material as their small group study. And so wherever you find yourself, welcome. We are absolutely delighted that you're with us. Let's review the first six chapters of Daniel. And then I'll answer a few questions that have come in, and then we'll launch right into our topic for tonight. You remember in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel is taken captive. God is revealed as the God who turns defeat into victory, the God who turns sorrow into joy. And in our lives, we experience at times the defeats of the devil. But God can turn every defeat into a victory. In chapter 2, we see God revealing the future. He holds the future in his hands, knows our future, and can reveal it to us. He says in Psalm 32, verse 8, I will guide you with mine eye. Isaiah 58, verse 11, God says, I'll guide you continually. So he is the God who guides us. If he's majestic enough, wise enough to guide the destiny of nations, I can safely trust him and put my life in his hands. In Daniel chapter 3, God is the God who leaps into the flames of our lives. He, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down to the golden image. They ended up in the fiery furnace, but God was there to protect them. In the last days, once again, a despotic world ruler will pass a universal decree commanding worship. Daniel 3, Revelation 13 are in parallel. We see that there. And, uh, but once again, God is a mighty deliverer, and he'll be there to deliver us like he delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Chapter 4, we find the, a, a heathen king saying, Is not this great Babylon I have built in his pride and his arrogance? Just like Lucifer in heaven in Isaiah 14, where he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will be like the Most High. Nebuchadnezzar had that pride in his heart, that Lucifer spirit. God humbled his pride. Nebuchadnezzar lost his throne, wandered around like a wild beast for seven years, but he looked to heaven. His sanity was restored. He once again received his royal robe, his crown of diadem, of glory in his throne. So likewise, we too, in our lostness, almost wander around like wild beasts on a planet called Earth. But when we look to heaven, Jesus clothes us with his righteousness, gives us sonship. We sit on the throne with him. He says, you are my sons and daughters, your priests and kings unto God. And we reign again. I like Isaiah 45, 22 that says, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. And so like that ancient king, we look to heaven and we find our salvation there, not in ourselves. We find it in the grace of God. In Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar, grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, throws a drunken feast, but he defiles the sanctuary of God because Babylon has robbed the ancient sanctuary and brought in golden vessels from that sanctuary of God in Jerusalem, brought in the golden candlestick, and they cross the bounds of God's mercy. The cup of iniquity is filled, and uh, the strange writing is written on the wall, many, many tekel yafars, and they're weighed in the balances and found wanting. What does this chapter say about God? It says God's a God of mercy, but he's a God of judgment. He's a God of love, but he's a God of law. It says that there are boundaries to God's mercy. It says that nations and individuals can fill up the cup of their iniquity. What does it say to you and me? First, it says judgment's hanging out over this world, that this world is fastly through its sin and iniquity and transgression and rebellion against God. It's filling up its cup of iniquity, and soon Jesus will come. Just like in the days of Noah, 
this world filled up its cup of iniquity. It went beyond the mercy of God and the probation of God. God's mercy is always there. God's love is always there. But we can turn our back on that mercy. We can turn our back on that love. Just like in the days of Lot, fire fell. Why? Why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Because they went beyond God's mercy. They turned their backs on It says that judgment's hanging over our world, but it also says to you and me that when the still small voice of God speaks to us, when Christ's light illuminates our heart, that we should respond to it. We shouldn't trifle with his mercy, shouldn't play games with his love, because judgment comes to every man, woman, and child. Daniel chapter 6 we find the God who's steadfast forever. Daniel's at the end of his life now, probably about 87 years old. He prays three times a day. You know, Daniel is steadfast from the time he's 17 to the time he's 87, 70 years in Babylon. But yet he's faithful to God, never wavering. Daniel chapter 6 talks to us about a God who is steadfast forever. And it appeals to us never, never to waver. Well, with that summary... There were a couple of questions that did come in that I want to spend time answering. And so let me take a look at those questions. Here's one from Angela. She says, Pastor, it says a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. Who was that watcher and that holy one? Was it Jesus or an angel? Usually when the Bible talks about a watcher and a holy one, uh, it's talking about angelic beings. Typically, that's the scene of the expression in Scripture. Um, here's one from uh, Wasera in Seattle. You taught us so well that the Median uh, Medes took over the kingdom of Babylon. Were the kingdoms of Media and Persia ruling concurrently? Which among these kingdoms were superior? Thank you. The Medes and the Persians overthrew Babylon, 539 BC. The leader of the Medes was uh, Darius. The leader of the Persians was Cyrus. And uh, Darius was really a, a Median general uh, who ruled that empire. Cyrus was the uh, king. And uh, the Persians dominated over the Medes. We're going to see that today in our Bible study. So the Persian Empire was much, much stronger than the Median Empire. Now, look, if you have any questions about the Bible, about Daniel, please feel free to write them in. We're going to put that up on the screen just now. You you can write uh, your questions to infolives365.com. That's info at hopelives365.com. If you want the study guides for the lessons, we have study guides for our lessons, you go to hopelives365.com forward slash weekly Bible study. That's hopelives365.com forward slash Bible study. Well, with that background, Let's jump right into Daniel chapter 7. We'll bow our heads to pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you are the God of the universe. Thank you that this world is in, in your control. Bless us as we study the word of God in the book of Daniel. Speak to us through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We enter into a new phase of our study. We're going into the prophetic portion of the book of Daniel. In the first six chapters, we had one prophecy in Daniel chapter 2. In the last six chapters, every chapter, indeed, is a prophecy or an introduction to that prophecy. You'll remember in the first prophecy that we studied in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep, and as he dreamed, he dreamed a dream he couldn't remember. It was a dream of a great image, head of gold, breast and arms of silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, and then a rock cut out without hands smashed the image, became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. When you look at that image, we've studied before, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold, or Babylon, your nation, is this head of gold. Then Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, after you, there shall arise another kingdom. So the four metals, gold, silver, brass, iron represented four successive nations that would rule the world uh, f after the dream was given. Babylon represented the head of gold. The Medes and Persians overthrew the Babylonians. They ruled from 539 uh, to 
they, they began their rule in, in 539 and ended it in 331. The Greeks took over next, ruled from 331 to 168, that's BC. The Romans overthrew the Greeks and they ruled from 168 to about 351 AD where their nation fell apart and the barbarian tribes from the north came down. So you have four nations, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Rome is divided into 10 divisions. Those divisions are like iron and clay that do not mix. Then in the days of these kings with divided Europe, a divided Middle East, divided Africa, during the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that will never be moved. So the kingdoms of earth fade away. They go into insignificance as God establishes his eternal everlasting kingdom. Now, there's an important principle of prophetic interpretation in the book of Daniel. It's called repetition and enlargement. What's it called, everybody? What's it called? Repetition and what? Enlargement. So you have four great lines of prophecy in Daniel. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8 and 9 together, and Daniel 11 and 12. Four lines of prophecy, Daniel 2. Daniel 7, Daniel 8 and 9 together, Daniel 11 and the first part of Daniel 12. Each of these prophecies repeats the prophecy before. So the structure is always Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then they keep adding in these prophecies. It's repetition and enlargement. Now, when you look at the four metals, you have gold, silver, brass, iron, iron and clay. What do you notice about that immediately in Daniel 2? Descending moral value. So you have the gold, silver, and brass, and iron, feet of iron and clay. You have a statue. Would you want to build a structure on iron and clay that's falling apart at the bottom, at the toes, that can't support the structure? Not at all. So you have descending moral value in the image. The rock comes at a time of moral degeneracy in our world, where there is little ethical accountability in our world. Our world has become a sex-centered, thrill-jaded, morally twisted generation. And Christ says, that's enough, and he comes. That's Daniel 2. Now you come to Daniel 7, and you have repetition and enlargement. So we're repeating with different symbols the ba- the same um nations adding to the description, broadening the description, and then we're adding some interesting material that we'll study today. So let's go to Daniel 7. The first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and the visions of his head while on his bed. Now this is Daniel's dream, not Nebuchadnezzar's, his first dream recorded by Daniel in the book. He's probably in his 60s at this time. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Daniel spoke saying, verse 2, Daniel 7, I saw in my vision by night and behold, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Now, when we read about four winds of heaven blowing on the great sea and we read about the four uh, the winds and, and, and add that to the sea, the great sea. What's this talking about? You know, when we study Bible prophecy, Peter says in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 19 to 21 that prophecy is like a light that lights our way in the darkness, but no prophecy is of any what? Private interpretation. So we don't have to guess at what winds represent or what the sea represents in the Bible. Because not only does God give to us the symbol, but he gives us the interpretation. So let's see if we can see how God uses in prophecy winds. We're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 49. Jeremiah chapter 49. And uh, we're going to look there at Jeremiah 49. And let's look at verse, let's start in Jeremiah 49. With verse 36, God is describing destruction. And he says in Jeremiah 49, verse 36, against Elam, 
will I bring four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There'll be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. When we think of windy scenes, you think of tornado, you think of a hurricane, you think, what do you think of? You think of a destruction, right? Then it says, I will cause Elam, verse 37, to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them. So he first says the four winds are going to come upon them. Then he talks about disaster coming upon them. Do we find any other place in the Bible in prophecy where it talks about the four winds? We do. You go to the book of Revelation in chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Again, we find something about the four winds. Revelation, the seventh chapter. And if you look there at verse 1, for example, again, it says, After these things, Revelation 7, verse 1, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. That I saw another, Then I saw another angel from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted not to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, sea, or the trees till, till we've uh, sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So here in the last days of verse history, just before the coming of Jesus, the winds of destruction will blow. The winds of pestilence will blow. The winds of disaster will blow. And God says, hold those winds back until my people make their eternal decision for Christ and to be obedient to his truth and his law. And they're sealed with the seal of protection of the Holy Spirit in their foreheads so they're not affected by the winds. So what does wind represent? Wind represents destruction. So it says here in Daniel 7, verse 2, Dan and Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, behold, the four winds winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. So winds, he see winds of destruction. Now what about the sea? What about the sea? What does the sea represent? Daniel, rather Revelation, because Daniel and Revelation are companion books. Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. Revelation 17, verse 15. And he said to me, the waters which you saw, that's the sea, where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Remember, the harlot was a symbol of the false church and uh, error, apostasy, godlessness. So the harlot is sitting on what? The waters. And, uh, and, 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 and she's dominated over the waters. And he said to me, the waters you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So when the winds blow upon the great sea, the sea represents people. So you have destruction among the peoples there of the Middle East at this period of time of the book of Daniel in Babylon. Then it says, and, and out of this destruction that's coming, out of this catastrophe, out of this disaster that would come, Daniel sees, and four beasts came up from the sea different from one another. So the beasts were what? They were different from one another. What is a beast in Bible prophecy? Daniel 7, verse 17. The great beasts, which are four. How many of them are there? Four. Are four kings that will arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. So the four beasts are four kings. If you have a marginal reference, it says four kingdoms. This is made clearer even in verse 23. So do you see Daniel 7, verse 23? Then he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the kingdoms. So what have we seen so far? This is what we've seen. We've seen the principle of repetition and enlargement. There were four medals in Daniel chapter 2. There are four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. The beasts or these kingdoms arise out of the conflict and devastation in the populated areas of the world at that time. So 
Then he begins to describe the beast. Verse 4, the first was like a lion. That's the first beast. Now, another principle of prophecy is the prophecy always begins where the prophet is. The prophecies of Daniel begin in Babylon when Daniel is in captivity. The prophecies in Revelation begin in the first century, and they take you onward from there when John was a captive on the island of Patmos. So the prophecy always begins where the prophet is. The, the, these timeline prophecies have repetition and enlargement, and these timeline prophecies, in addition to that, uh, expand on one another. So there was a lion and ha that had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. A lion with eagle's wings is a fit symbol of the nation of Babylon. I've traveled throughout the Middle East a pretty fairly amount, a great deal, in fact. If you go to the Istanbul Museum, you will see original tiles that were gathered in the excavation of Babylon, and they were part of the procession way that led to the, into the city uh, and into the temples. And you will notice that there are lions and e as eagles' wings as a symbol of Babylon. If you go to the museum in East Berlin called the Pergamum Museum, you'll see some of the work of the German archaeologists. And again, you will see original lion with eagle's wings. In fact, there was a statue uncovered in Babylon by the archaeologists with a lion with eagle's wings. So the idea of a lion in eagle's wings is a very common symbol of Babylon. In fact, when you look at these four beasts, even today, nations have uh, symbols of the uh, with animals as, as their symbol, don't they? Sure. And it was the same that God is using here, the very symbol of Babylon, that would be easily recognizable to, de to describe it. A lion is the king of the beasts. Babylon ruled the then known world. And an eagle is a uh, symbol of, the, of a chief of the birds. And again, fitting symbols of Babylon in its regal royalty, in its fierceness, in its ability to dominate the world. But it says, a lion had eagle's wings. I watched till the wings were plucked off was lifted up from the earth, made to stand on its feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. What happened to Babylon? Well, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, lost his throne, went out and wandered in the wilderness for seven years till he got his throne back. But then Babylon fell under the days of Belshazzar with Darius and Cyrus attacking it, and it became a very tame empire from a lion. Very, very tame, man's heart, weak, but another aspect of that man's heart can refer to the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar, where he now has a heart for God after he goes out and eats grass like a lion. So Babylon falls. Babylon ruled from 605 to 539. In 539, Cyrus and Darius attack, and the Babylon falls. You look here at Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It raised up on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. The second empire, Babylon, the second empire, Medo-Persia, overthrows Babylon. This second empire is like a bear, raises itself up on one side. What does that mean? The Medes and Persians attacked. The Persians became dominant over the not only Babylon, but over the Medes. So the bear raises itself on one side with Persia, the dominant power under Cyrus. What's this talking about that it has three ribs in its mouth? You know, Bible prophecy is so incredibly accurate. For Babylon, it used this very symbol of Babylon, the lion with eagle's wings, accurate. For Medo-Persia, it uses a bear and uh, the bear raised itself up on one side. The Persians dominated the Medes, but also three ribs. What does that mean? It devoured three ribs. To be the dominant power, Medo-Persia had to overcome Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt, the three ribs. And uh, it said, arise, devour much flesh. But would Medo-Persia dominate forever? Certainly not. Verse 6, 
After this, I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its head, four, on its back, four wings of a bird. The beast was given four heads and dominion was given to it. Now, if you want to describe rapid conquest, what animal would you use? A leopard. If you want to describe rapid, 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 rapid contest, conquest, what would you do with your leopard? You'd put four wings on him, right? The rapid conquest of Alexander the Great, who conquered the world by 33 years old, and there were no more worlds to conquer, is described by the leopard. See, Bible prophecy does not guess, it knows. Bible prophecy is accurate, and the leopard uh, describing rapid conquest is fitting for Alexander the Great. What about these four heads? Alexander dies in um, a drunken stupor, probably, but weakened by alcohol, certainly, and, and probably by malaria. You know, incidentally, uh, Alexander wanted to rebuild Babylon and make it one of his provincial capitals. God said that Babylon would never be rebuilt. Uh, Alexander took 10,000 men and uh, took them there to rebuild Babylon, but Alexander died, and after Alexander died so quickly, they, uh, they uh, abandoned the project. Bible prophecy again was true. Babylon would never, ever, ever be rebuilt. What about these four heads? Alexander dies. Four generals, rather than destroying one another and going to war, although some of them did, they div the empires divided up in four major places. Four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Seleucus. Cassander, Ptolemy, Seleucus, Lysimachus. Divide up the empire. Bible prophecy is so incredibly accurate. A lion with eagle's wings, exactly the symbol of Babylon. A bear raising up on one side with three ribs, exactly the description of Medo-Persia. A leopard, rapid conquest, exactly the description of the Greek empire. But Greece doesn't rule forever. 168 BC, the Romans attack. Verse seven, after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had 10 horns. Now notice, here is another beast. It had iron teeth, devoured, broke all the feet before it, different from all the beasts. Just think about that. This beast is described as being ferocious. The Roman Empire overthrew the Greek Empire. When some of the ancient writers wrote, they said, like a, like a, like a vicious beast, Rome strode across the landscape with its iron monarchy crushing everything before it. You read the book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. He uses some of the very symbols of Bible prophecy. So Rome, Rome rules 168 BC to 351 AD. Verse 8, I was considering the horns. There was another little horn. Now what happens to the Roman Empire? Is it uh, four empires and then a fifth empire, a sixth empire? I mean... Uh, if I were describing it and didn't know anything about the prophecy, I might say, well, there's a lion with eagle's wings. There's a bear that raised itself up on one side. There's a leopard that has uh, wings and four heads. And there's this uh, fourth beast that's a, like a dragon-like beast breathing out fire. It has iron teeth. And then I might say, well, there's another beast and another. No, 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 no. no. What happens to Rome? It says this has 10 horns, the divisions of the Roman empire. Ten is often in the Bible a symbol of kingdom, an earthly kingdom setting up in counterfeit to God's eternal everlasting kingdom. Verse 8, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, a horn symbols power or kingdom, a little one coming up from among them. Before three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and speaking pompous things. We actually have so much material in Daniel chapter 7. We're going to study about this little horn next week. And we'll have a whole uh, session on it. But suffice it to say today, 
there would be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Rome would be divided into 10 divisions. Another power would rise after the fall of, of Rome, but it would not be a political power. It would be a religious political power that would dominate through the Middle Ages, that would crush, that would attempt to crush the truths of the Bible. It would be a political religious power that asserted man's authority rather than God's. We're going to study about that next week. But so after Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, after the divisions of the Roman Empire and the rise of this political power, what is the common theme of them all? Babylon's desire is to rule the world. Medo-Persia's, Greece, Rome's, the, when the Ten divisions take place. This little horn power wants to have a religious political confederacy to rule the world. But God then does something surprising. He shifts Daniel's attention from this earth to the throne room of the universe. And in one of the most amazing visions in all the Bible, we see that there. Daniel 7, verse 9 through 11. I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days were seated. The garment of his head was as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, his wheels like burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. Many translations, like the King James says, the judgments was set, and the books were opened. Babylon ruled, Medo Persia ruled, Greece ruled, Rome ruled. Ten divisions of the empire. A political religious system rises to dominate. But Jesus says, judgment will come. And Daniel looks up into heaven and he sees in the judgment bar of God all things made right. And that judgment takes place just before the coming of Jesus to declare the righteousness of Christ, to declare the, the goodness of God. In that judgment, all things are set right, and Christ becomes victorious as he receives the kingdom. It's not the kingdoms of man, it's the kingdoms of Christ. Let's study a little bit about this judgment throughout Scripture. Let's go first to the book of Psalms. Psalm 98, Psalm 98. I want to take a brief look at the judgment. Psalm 98. What's taking place in the judgment? In the judgment, the great controversy between good and evil is settled. In the judgment, Jesus is revealed as the worthy ruler of the universe. Psalm chapter 98. And we're looking there at verse 1 and verse 9. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him victory. So we're singing a new song. Why? Because the powers of earth have been crushed, because the cruel despotic empires now are judged and destroyed. Oh, sing a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. Christ is victorious. Verse 9, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. So the judgment reveals the victory of Christ over all the powers of evil. The judgment reveals the righteousness of Christ. Now you ask, does the Bible teach that before the coming of Jesus, there will be a judgment? It does. Take your Bible, please, and turn to Revelation chapter 14. Daniel and Revelation are the two great prophetic books of the Bible. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. John writes, he's exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to dwell upon the earth. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, fear God, that's obey God. Have a mindset to put God first in your life. Give glory to God for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters. The hour of God's judgment. 
Satan has said God is unfair, God is unjust. Satan has said that God is not worthy to rule the universe. Satan has said that Christ is not the one to sit on the throne as the son of the Father. The divine, eternal Christ is not to rule with his Father and the Spirit through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Satan has charged God with being unfair, unjust, an arbitrary dictator. But yet, in the judgment, all things are set right. The hour of God's judgment has come. God reveals in the judgment his graciousness, his righteousness, his love, his mercy, his worthiness. Now, but this is an interesting text in Revelation 14, verse 7, because it said the hour of God's judgment has come. Not it will come, but it has come. When Jesus spoke about the judgment in Matthew chapter 12, the judgment was still a future event. But John sees a present tense judgment. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 what does Jesus say? But I say to you that every idle word that men may speak, I tell you, that really is striking, isn't it? it? Makes us take account of our words. Every idle word that men shall speak, they will give account of in the day of judgment. They will give account of in the day of judgment. In other words, Jesus said there's a day of judgment that is coming. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Again, you're going to find a future judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Again, the judgment in Jesus' day was in the future. The judgment in Paul's day was also in the future. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive things done in his body, whether it's good or bad. We so Notice the judgment is, is a future event. What does it mean the hour of God's judgment has come? Is there a judgment before the second coming of Christ to determine who is worthy to enter the kingdom? Well, you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, and uh, chapter, we go to Revelation, chapter 22, and we're going to look at the idea that when Christ comes, human probation has already closed. There is no second chance The judgment has already taken place. Revelation 22, verse 11 and verse 12. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. If Christ is coming to give out the rewards... There must be a judgment previous to his coming to determine who receives what reward when he comes. That's why the Bible says when Jesus comes, there's no second chance. So when John says the hour of God's judgment has come, the divine clock has struck the hour. In heaven's most holy place of the sanctuary, 10,000 times 10,000 heavenly beings gather round. In a divine moment of destiny, where an eternal judgment takes place, wickedness is destroyed. God's people are exonerated. The devil says you cannot save them. They're sinners. Jesus says they've responded to my grace. They're charmed by my love. Now, when we look at the judgment, the judgment says the hour of God's judgment in the judgment Jesus reveals that he's done everything he can to save every human being. That there's nothing more that Christ could have done to save human beings. Here in Daniel chapter 7, we find why the judgment should not be a scary uh, event for the people of God. If we are in Christ if the righteousness of Christ covers us, if the power of Christ has transformed us, if we are in Jesus and Jesus is our Savior and our Lord, our guarantee of eternal life, we need not fear judgment. Look, here's what it says. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and onward. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Who's that? Jesus. 
came with the clouds of heaven. What are they? The angels. He came to the ancient of days. So here you have, you know, God, Jesus coming before the Father. Then to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. It was given to Jesus that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve, serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. His kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Babylon rises and falls. Medo-Persia rises and falls. Greece rises and falls. Rome rises and falls. A little horn power. The, the Roman Empire is divided. A little horn power rises. A political religious power. We'll study about that next week. It establishes human laws rather than accepting God's law. But yet, these powers pass away. And in the judgment... The eternal, everlasting kingdom is given by the Father to Jesus Christ. And Jesus will reign forever and ever. Why is the judgment good news for the people of God? It's good news first because Christ is exonerated. The Father is exalted. The Holy Spirit is revealed as the third person of the Godhead, as the mighty one. The judgment reveals that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are worthy to rule the universe forever. Why is the judgment good news? Because in the judgment, the kingdom is given to Christ. Through the cross of Christ, Jesus brought back this world. But the judgment's good news also. Why? Drop your eyes here in Daniel chapter 7 and look at verse 20. 1 and 22. I was watching the same horn made war with the saints. That's this little horn, this uh, religious political power who tries to destroy the people of God. He, he's prevailing against him. Until when? Until when? Until when? Verse 22, until the Ancient of Days came, judgment was made. Judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High God, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So why is the judgment so incredibly good news for us? Because judgment is made in favor of the saints. The evil oppressors can no longer harass or persecute or torment us. And what happens? The court seated, verse 26, and they shall take away the dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms. You see, the, the judgment's going to take away the kingdoms of evil, but the kingdoms and dominion, the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom's an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. The kingdom is given to the saints of the Most High. The judgment's good news. When your name comes up in judgment, when my name comes up in judgment, Jesus says, this man, this woman is one of mine. Judgment is passed in favor of the saints of God. And as judgment is passed in favor of the saints of God, as sons and daughters of God, we inherit the kingdom with Christ. And it's ours forever and ever and ever. Why is the judgment good news? John chapter 5, John chapter 5. John chapter 5 teaches the marvelous news of the judgment. John 5, we're looking there at verse 24. The scripture is very clear. We'll read verse John 5, we'll look there at verse 24. 23 to start, and then we'll go over to verse 24. John 5, verse 20, 24, uh, and then we'll read 25, rather. John 5, 24, and 25. Most assuredly, I love the word assuredly. That's certainly, definitely. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but is passed from death unto life. You see the word for judgment there? It's the, you say, wait a minute. I thought the Bible says that all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It does, righteous and unrighteous. I thought Peter said judgment must begin at the house of God, the righteous. It does. Well, what does this mean then? 
You see the word judgment? It's the word krisis in Greek, and it is better translated condemnation. So we'll not come into the condemnation of the judgment. So here's the good news about the judgment. Most assuredly, Jesus says, definitely, certainly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but pass from death to life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of God, the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Jesus will come again. And before he comes, there is a judgment. Those that have accepted Christ. Christ is their eternal Lord and Savior. In the judgment, favor is passed in behalf of the people of God. And when Jesus comes, probation has closed and his people are resurrected or they're alive to receive glorious immortal bodies, resurrected in those immortal bodies, receiving those immortal bodies for those who are alive is instantaneous. And they're caught up to meet Jesus in the air. No more sickness or sorrow or heartache or suffering or death. The judgment is not bad news, it's good news. In the judgment, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are exalted before the universe. In the judgment, Christ receives the kingdom. In the judgment, favor is passed in behalf of you. God declares, this man is my son. This woman is my daughter. And we live with him forever and ever and ever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you with all of our hearts that we need not fear the judgment if we are settled with Christ. But if we're not settled with Christ, if we haven't fully given our hearts to Christ, there's no way Jesus can save us in the judgment. And we need to tremble then. Oh, Lord, help us now. Be sure that we are settled in our hearts with a total commitment to Christ forever and ever and ever. And Father, I pray thee too that if there's somebody here that hasn't made that full decision, let them know that the only way to pass the judgment is a complete surrender to Christ, a confession of our sin, a repentance, and a changed life. Then we can approach the judgment in Christ and through Christ and by Christ with confidence. And we thank you for that and look forward to that day that you will come soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Be sure to join us next week because we have an absolutely amazing program. I'm going to go over... This idea of the little horn, a religious political power that would rise in the Middle Ages and distort God's truth and attempt to change God's very law. You're not going to want to miss that program. We're going to be talking about how to stand in the judgment. So be sure if you have some friends that may, you think may want to join you, family members, invite them. Invite a small group to your home to participate. Still not too late. We've got the most exciting chapters in the book of Daniel, the last six chapters. Thank you for joining us, and God bless you as we go.